Hello and welcome to my channel. Today we are going to talk about controllers for the brushless motors. Let's get started. We can adjust connect the battery to the brushless motor. It does not work like this. We need to have the controller between the battery and the motor. But there are at least three ways to run the brushless motor without controller. First, we can connect the battery to the different poles of the motor in the certain sequence. Oof, it's difficult. Also, you can run one brushless motor with another brushless motor. In this case, you don't need the battery. For this, we need to connect wires from one motor to another. And it works easily like this. For the third way of running this motor, you need to take one pole in one hand, another pole in another hand, and the third pole in your mouse. Like this. And afterwards, you need to flex different muscles in order to make the current pass through the coils and to move this motor. Let me show you. It demands a lot of practice, but it works quite well. All these methods are not really practical. But do you know what is practical? Yes, controllers. And in order to understand how the controllers work, let's briefly look at the theory. What is brushless motor? It's basically the set of the magnetic coils and permanent magnets. The magnetic coils, they make the stator of the rotor, so they don't move. And the permanent magnets, they fix to the rotor and when the motor runs, they rotate. Usually on the brushless motor, there are many magnetic coils and many permanent magnets. We say that there is a lot of pole pairs on the motor. Let's represent this schematically with only three coils and one permanent magnet as a rotor. Here I have in runner, so this is permanent magnet which rotates. And this is out runner, so the magnets which rotates the outside of the stator. But most of the conclusions from the in runner are valid for the out runner. And these three coils, they are connected like this. And so we have three wires coming out of our motor. And if now we will apply sinusoidal waves on each of this pole, and if each of the sine wave has 120 degrees phase separation, in this case we will have the rotating magnetic field inside here. This is represented in this graph. Here we have the currents in A, B and C. A, B and C. And on the x-axis I have the magnetic field orientation. And this is magnetic field produced by our magnetic coils. Like, for example, if we take the point zero. In the point zero we have the maximum positive current here. And some negative current equal negative currents in B and C. It means that the current flows like this. There is maximum current here. And there is smaller current here and here. And so they sum up and they come out from the A. This will energize at maximum this coil and at some point these two coils. So it's going to produce the magnetic field upward. If we take the point 180 degrees here, we have the opposite. The maximum negative current in this coil, in the A coil, and some positive current in the B and C coils. And so that's gonna be here the maximum current again at the point zero, but at the opposite direction. So it's going to produce the magnetic field downward. And if, for example, if we take the point at the 90 degrees, we have the zero current at the coil A, and we have some positive current in the coil B and some negative current in the coil C. So positive here, negative here, it's going to produce the magnetic field like this, horizontal. And in this case, we have zero current here. And so the current flows from here to here. And so you can see like this with the sine waves at 120 degrees phase shift, we can position our magnetic field in any direction. But we don't want just orientate magnetic field in the different directions. What we want to do, we want to move the rotor. And for example, like this, when the rotor is horizontal, in order to move it, in order to have the maximum torque, we need to have the magnetic field either upward or downward. In this case, we're going to have either the force like this or like this. And depending on which direction, we will have 
different direction of the motion. We need to be either at the point 0 degrees, so the magnetic field upward, or at the point 180 degrees, magnetic field downward. So for the maximum torque, we need to have the 90 degrees difference between the position of our rotor and the position of the magnetic field produced by the magnetic coils. This was my complicated explanation of the simple thing. With Arduino, in order to produce these different levels of the current, we're going to use PWM, pulse width modulation. We're going to change the duty cycle of the pulses. Like if we have the pulses like this, the average value is somewhere here. If we have the pulses like this with the lower duty cycle, the average value is going to be somewhere here. And with the low duty cycle, the average value is somewhere here. Like this with the pulse width modulation, PWM, we can change the values of uh, our output. And of course, in order to have this average values, the frequency of our pulses should be quite high. There is one problem with all this. And this problem is that with this PWM, we control the voltage. And in order to move our motor, we need current. And in our motor, there is a lot of coils. So our voltage waveform is not the same as our current waveform. There is a phase shift between them. And in order to compensate this, it's complicated. You need to have the measurements of the current on the motor and you need to take this into account. How to do this? It's way beyond of my understanding and it's way beyond of the scope of this simple video. For today's video, I prepared this piece. It's basically consists of the controller and two brushless motors. Each of these two motors has this 3D printed part and on top of this 3D printed part, there is a magnet. And in front of this magnet, there is a magnetic encoder. The controller is quite simple and it's based on the Arduino. Let me show you how it looks. This is a controller from the gimbal. And on this board, we have the Arduino compatible microcontroller, FTDI chip in order to communicate through the USB. And there is these two big drivers. This is L6234. And these two drivers, they can drive brushless motor with the current up to 3 to 5 amps. I have this cover on top because one of the LED on the board is uncomfortably bright. This board is quite cheap. And uh, similar to this board, you can find on this website. They produce the controllers based on this L6234 driver. So check their website. They also make a Arduino library to use this controller. But today we are not going to use this Arduino library. We're going to write everything ourselves. This is the schematics of the all connections inside this piece. So inside there is Arduino one motor and the second motor. The both motors, they are connected to the drivers L6234 and the driver of the first motor is connected to the pin 356. The driver of the second motor is connected to the pin 9, 10, 11. And these six pins are the only pins on this Arduino which are capable of producing PWM signal. Also, there are two encoders. Both of these encoders are AS5048A. These encoders, they have two ways how to communicate the position of the magnet. First way is using the PWM signal and the second way is using SPI bus. Here I connected both of them in order to test and see which one works better. So the PWM signal from the first encoder is connected to the analog input one and PWM signal from the second encoder is connected to the analog input two. I also connected SPI Master input slave output of the Arduino is connected to the master input slave output encoder 1 and of the encoder 2. Clocks connected to the encoder 1 and connected to the encoder 2. And select pin of the encoder 1 is connected to the channel 2. And select pin of the encoder 2 is connected to the channel 4. And what is important for this type of encoders is that you should also connect master output slave input to the 3.3 .3 volt on the encoder. So you need to put this jumper. So like this, we can use either PWM signal to see the position of the encoder or SPI bus. We know the theory. We have our test bench. Now what is left is to take care of the Arduino code. So first we're going to test the code without encoder. So meaning that we're going to do the open loop control. 
we're just going to send sine waves on the three poles of the motors and see if the motor runs. For the Arduino code, I use the code from this YouTube channel, Random Access Projects. But I also slightly modified this code in order to be able to connect the encoders with the SPI bus. So this is the program, it's written by this guy, but I made some slight modifications. Here we define the pin for the encoder. I'm not going to use this encoder, this is just for the reference. Here I define three pins for motor. This is probably the most important variable. This is the sine wave. So basically this is array with 48 values. And this array stores the sine wave. Like this we can calculate the sine very quickly. This is the index inside this array for the pole A. This is the index for the pole B and pole C of the motor. And as we deduced, it should be 120 degrees separated each other. And as in the PWM sign, we have 48 values. It means that 48 values is 360 degrees and 120 degrees is 16 values. So that's why the step A is just zero, step B is 16. And step C, 32. 32 is 240 degrees separated from the step A or 120 degrees separated from step B. This three line in the setup, they increase the frequency of the timers and thus it increases the frequency of the PWM signal. And it's the zero timer we keep here as a three because otherwise it's a mess up PWM readings of the encoder. So that's why here it's three. In the loop, we increase the step A by one. Like this, with each loop, we increase the index of the pole A and the index of the pole B and C is just 120 degrees separated. So that's why it's A plus 16 plus 32. We need to have this value from 0 to 47 because our PWM sign has 48 values. Here we trim these values from 0 to 47. So if in this procedure we will have the value like 49, it's going to be 1 after these lines. And these three lines, they put the PWM signal on our pins of the motor. And afterwards, I just print all of this in the serial. This is a delay in order not to spin our motor too fast. Here I read the encoder data. And here we print the position of the encoder. Let's upload this file on our test bench and see how it works. And as soon as we upload it, the motor starts to rotate. Let's look at the serial plotter. Ooh, and we have really nice sine waves. And this yellow line is the encoder. So the value of the encoder, it's increase, increase, increase. And after one revolution, it goes back to zero. And what is interesting is that there is many sign periods in one motor revolution. So there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven periods, exactly seven periods of the sign in one revolution. It means that this motor has seven pole pairs. And now we will try to run this motor in the closed loop control. We're going to run this side of the test bench. With the encoder, we will find out the position of the rotor. And like this, we know which kind of current we should send to each of the three poles. I also going to use the second encoder as the input. So with this second encoder, I will control the position of this motor. So now we need both encoders. We also introduce the torque of the motor which is not really the torque, but we call it torque. Now we don't need any more this line as before, because this line we used for the constant speed rotation of the motor. The torque we introduce over here, and it's going to be from zero to 100. Here we read the data from the encoder A, and we map this value to the zero to 48 times seven. So seven is the number of the pole pairs, and 48 is the size of our PWM array. So this is going to be kind of electronic position of the shaft. We do the same for the second encoder. And we said that the set point of the our motor is going to be the position of the encoder A. And so afterwards we introduce the error, the difference between the actual position of the motor and the set point. And you remember that we said that for the maximum torque we need to have the 90 degrees shift between the shaft position and the magnetic field position. And so we're going to use it over here. So for this we introduce the new variable direction B. And if the error is positive and if we need to rotate the motor in one direction, we say that this variable is equal to 12. 12 is the 90 degrees in our 0 to 48 values. And if we need to rotate the motor in another direction, in this case it's gonna be 48 minus 12, 36. So this is kind of minus 90 degree. 
And here we say that our torque is proportional to this error, meaning that the higher the error, the more current we're gonna put in our motor. And so the current step A, so the index of the pole A, it's just the electronic position of the shaft, plus this variable which stores in which direction we should move, and plus some offset. This is offset because uh, we put our encoder in kind of a random position. We did not align it with the pole pairs of the motor. This offset is could be any value from 0 to 47, so it's quite easy to find it experimentally, and I already found it that 0 works fine for me. So let's upload this data and see how it works. And uh, by the way, now we are powered by the USB, but if we power it with the battery, it's gonna have a little bit more torque. It basically works, but there is a lot of vibration, you see. It also holds position. I suppose this vibration is comes uh, from the fact that this Arduino cannot read properly the PWM signal. And there is a lot of noise on this reading and uh, this gives all this da -da 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 shakiness. Now let's see how it's gonna work with the SPI bus. So we're going to use exactly the same code as before, but instead of reading the encoder position with PWM signal, we're going to read encoder position with the SPI bus. So here I define the select pins for each encoder. This is the pins for the SPI and the rest of the program is the same. To read the encoder position, I use this function. This function reads the encoder position from the SPI bus. Let's upload this code. There is no vibrations anymore. Let's see how it works with the battery. There is just a tiny vibrations, but otherwise it's perfect. It holds the position perfectly. Nice! Ha 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 ha! And we have one more Arduino code to test. On this YouTube channel, Random Access Project, they call this steer by wire demo. And I call it telepresence. So basically in this test, we're going to use both motors and we're going to control one motor with another one. The code is quite similar to the previous one. So again, we use the SPI bus for reading the data from the encoders. So we initialize both motors, we read the encoder data, and in this code there is a magic line. And in this line we set the set point to the average of each encoder position. And afterwards we just control these two motors, as before. Let's see what this code do. Upload. It does not work well when we have the power only from the USB, because now we drive both motors, and these both motors, they need more power than just one motor. So let's test it with the battery. If I rotate the first motor, in this case the second motor rotates too. And if I rotate this one, this one rotates. But if I block this motor, fix it, this resists. And if I fix this motor, this resists. And if I apply some force here, some friction force, I feel this force on this motor. And if I do the vice versa, I feel this force here. So this is kind of telepresence from this motor to this motor or steer by wire. When you put one motor to steer your wheels and you use another motor to steer and you also have the force feedback. And of course, if you change the motors and controllers, you can also multiply this force or decrease this force. So I think this is a really interesting test. Thank you for watching this video till the end. I don't know if this was interesting for you, but it was definitely interesting for me. I was always interested in how the controllers work. And uh, we did not build a professional controller, but we built something which is working. I really love this demo of telepresence or steer by wire. It's really nice and I think it's gonna be very useful for the robotic arm. Imagine you can make like two arms and you can control one arm with another one and you will also have the force feedback. This is really nice. Please don't forget to put the like to this video. Don't forget to put one or several comments under this video. This helps a lot uh, to promote my channel. And also don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you are not subscribed yet. And as usual, I would like to say a huge thank you to my Patreons. Here's their names. 
Thanks to them, I have time and possibility to make these kind of projects. These best people, they help me to develop entire channel. Without them, it's not gonna be possible. Thank you for watching again. Good luck with your projects. Stay safe and see you next time.